An optical or light microscope is very friendly to living biological cells because all it does is shine light on the cells. As a result, it would be nice if we could still use light in our new imaging technology. We can't use any higher frequencies, uh, electromagnetic waves, because those waves are ionizing. And ionizing electromagnetic waves, like ultraviolet rays and x-rays and so forth, are damaging to living cells. To see if it's possible to extend the capabilities of optical microscopes to smaller features of biological cells, we need to be able to study the interaction of light, not just with biological cells, but also small nanometer scale features within biological cells. For this, we can turn to Maxwell's equations, which help us to solve the interaction of electromagnetic waves with different objects. Then, so that we can easily try out different ideas without having to immediately deal with actual living cells and a physical experimental setup, we can turn to FDTD modeling which we can use to solve Maxwell's equations. But before we get started, let's think about this for a moment. We're considering using an FDTD model to simulate the interaction of light with a collection of living cells. Let's say uh, a cubic one millimeter or so. And we would need to model this collection of living cells at a resolution of say at least 20 nanometers. So delta here would be 20 nanometers if we want to be able to study features within the, thin, within the cells that are as small as 20 nanometers. But at a grid resolution of 20 nanometers, we would need 1 e to the minus 3 divided by delta 20 e to the minus 9, that's 50,000 grid cells, to model just a distance of 1 millimeter. Which means in three dimensions, we would need 50k to the power of three for each dimension, which is 125 trillion cells to model one cubic millimeter. Running an FDTD model with over a trillion grid cells would be very computationally demanding. In terms of memory alone, we couldn't even fit such a model on a standard desktop. In fact, we would need one of the best supercomputers in the world just to hold the amount of memory needed to store the electric and magnetic field components of a grid having over a trillion grid cells. But say for the moment, we could fit the model onto a supercomputer. How long would such a model take to run? From the last design challenge, you may have noticed that the three-dimensional FDTD code ran quite a bit slower than the 1D and two-dimensional models we wrote earlier in the semester. And because of this, MATLAB is only really useful for running relatively short and small FDTD codes. So short and small codes. For these, it's convenient to both run the FDTD model and plot and analyze the results all within the same program. However, for three-dimensional codes, and especially 3D codes with over a trillion grid cells, MATLAB quickly turns into a bottleneck for obtaining results in a reasonable amount of time. Now, it's true that MATLAB can be run on, in parallel on supercomputers. However, almost no one, or maybe nobody, in the electromagnetics or physics community uses MATLAB as their primary simulation tool because the MATLAB program hogs the available memory and is relatively slow compared to other programming languages. By the way, as a side note, Python also is not suitable for heavy numerical computations because it is also relatively slow, just as MATLAB is. Instead, the electromagnetics community primarily uses Fortran or C++ for running large-scale simulations. This is also true for other communities that run large-scale simulations of physical systems, such as in the field of astrophysics or molecular dynamics or weather modeling and so on. They also primarily use Fortran and C++. This is because out of all the programming languages, Fortran and C++ are the fastest at performing mathematical calculations. Because Fortran and C++ are the fastest, and because they are so widely used for heavy computations, the libraries that have been created for parallelizing codes have so far only been developed for Fortran and C++. 
So although Fortran and C++ have been around for decades, they both have, they are still very relevant today and there is no indication that they are going away anytime soon. In this class, we're going to be introduced to the world of supercomputers and how to use a supercomputer to run a large-scale simulation. Now, we're not going to have time to create and run a huge FDTD model relating to our design challenge directly, because at this point, that would be a waste of computing resources, because we first need to learn how to use the supercomputers. However, we are going to run an FDTD code on a supercomputer, and by the end of this design challenge, you should have all the skills you need to create and run an FDTD model of any size on a supercomputer, even a model with, a tri with trillions of grid cells. Specifically, we're going to run a basic one-dimensional FDTD code on a supercomputer that is hosted at the University of Utah's Center for High Performance Computing, CHPC. To do this, you can either use Fortran or C++, but I recommend you use Fortran because Fortran and MATLAB largely follow the same programming style. Today, we'll first learn how to access the supercomputers. After that, we'll learn how to convert a simple 1D FDTD code written in MATLAB and change it into a Fortran code. Later on, we will learn how to parallelize that 1D FDTD code that's written in Fortran. I posted a code that you can use for this assignment if you like. It's a code that models only the incident grid of the one-dimensional total field scatter field assignment that you completed not that long ago. So you can easily create this code from the last assignment on total field scatter field if you want to use your own code. All you need to do is extract the incident grid from that code. Go ahead and run the code that's posted or the one that you created. You should see a plane wave, a Gaussian pulse, propagating through free space across the screen. So the source is here and it's in free space so it'll just propagate all the way across the screen. And here's a snapshot of the pulse after it has propagated for the same number of time steps as in the total field scatter field assignment. Make sure you can recreate these results before moving on. In the next video segment, you will learn how to connect to the CHPC supercomputers. There are three parts to this video. The first part introduces the interactive nodes on the supercomputer. The second part covers how to connect to HPC resources using, using a Linux or a Mac computer. And the third part, starting at about 5 minutes and 40 seconds, covers how to connect from a Windows machine. Watch the first part of the video and then which, watch whichever one of these, the second or the third part, depending on what type of computer you are using.